All right, so to discuss the uh, just passed uh, petroleum industry bill, we've got Honorable Henry Wawamba, who joins us from Abuja. He's a member of the committee on the PIB. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on the program. Can you hear me, Honorable? Very good morning, Chamberlain. Yes, I can hear okay. you. Okay. All right, then. So uh, after several years, the PIB has eventually been passed. But uh, I don't know if you've seen some of the reactions already, some uh, uh, persons uh, not too happy with some of the provisions. So just go ahead. Give us your perspective of the version of this bill and uh, what went down before it was passed. Thank you. Uh, very good morning to the team in Lagos. Um, as you know, the parliament has been trying to pass this bill for at least 15 years now. And so um, we are very proud of the work that we have done. Um, we think that it, it's a bill whose time has come, particularly the way it ties into our national conversations with regard to our developmental strides in economy, uh, earning of foreign exchange and what have you. The truth of the matter is that um, uh, the fossil industry, the extractive industry, particularly the dirty fuels like oil, uh, are, are products that have, uh, if you will, an expiry date in the next two to three decades. Uh, if we don't do whatever it is that we need to do, um, I mean, we're just going to be carrying uh, a form of energy when the rest of the world has moved on to cleaner and more efficient forms of energy. And so the petroleum industry bill has always been at the forefront. In the ninth assembly, we did start with a, 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 a legislative agenda that put this uh, at the fore. Of course, when COVID came, we revised our legislative agenda and put health. But if you go to uh, the section on economy, the top piece of legislation that the ninth House of Representatives had put on that we must pass, come what may, is the petroleum industry bill. Indeed, uh, our leadership had actually even committed the House of Reps on different occasions to dates and timelines to say, look, by this time, we're going to have it done. It's not a, p a new piece of legislation. It's, uh, it was, we, we worked on it on the 8th Assembly. It wasn't signed. 7th Assembly worked on it. Uh, this time around, it has come as an executive bill. And yesterday, on the floor, we passed all 319 clauses, including the controversial uh, clause 240 uh, that talked about the host community development fund. Now, speaking about that host community, um, there's been, you know, that argument which went back and forth as to who do they describe as the host community and then to benefit from that development fund? Because there are those who suggest that, I mean, okay, maybe you should just give us that perspective. Who were those that were described here? Okay as the host community? Once uh, an oil resource is domiciled in your land, you are a host community. If there's any kind of uh, drilling going on in your land, you are a host community. Installation of an oil facility, you are a host community. I think what we need to differentiate is the difference between a host community and an impacted community because you may have oil resource far away from where you, you, you reside, but the oil infrastructure passes through, let's say, for instance, a pipeline, your community, and if there's any activity of uh, oil pollution and all of that, you become an impacted community. So, but the provisions of the PIB deal squarely with those communities that have either of the resources or the facilities domiciled in and within their environment. So, the host community, the impacted community who pipelines pass through their area also benefit from that host community development fund. Is that right? They are not classified as host community for now. Uh, there, there's a different set of protocols that uh, uh, cater to when you have impact on the environment, no matter where it is. Uh, of course, you know that the Ministry of Environment, NOSDRA and DPR, do form a joint uh, inspection investigation team to go and assess the level of severity and all of that. What the host community trust fund seeks to do is to actually ensure that the failure that we have seen over time 
particularly with regards to the intervention that is happening at the level of the community, the community level, be it the 13% derivation or some of the other interventions in the NDDC, Amnesty Program, and all of those interventions that government has been having in the time past that have not really been able to translate to the kind of development that we want to see on ground, the host community provision is some kind of an inclusive arrangement that brings the community at the center of the conversations of what is important to them, what they want to see in terms of development, and how to go about it. So they're actually going to be in the committee that, that forms what they want and drives how it is implemented. Okay. Well, uh, Honorable Tajuddin Yusuf also joins us on the line on this matter. Good morning and thank you for joining us today on the program. So, yeah, uh, yes, the PIB has been passed, but all those debates that went down, uh, just getting to that part now where we're talking about uh, who qualifies, I mean, there's host community, there's impacted community, which we're getting some explanation. Could you uh, shed some light as well on uh, your impressions about how this went on? Uh, good morning. I, first of all, the mere fact that the PIB has got to this level of passage is commendable. However, uh, if, if you follow the debate in Senate, too, there was uh, some concern from the South South. I have information about the definition of host community and the partner community. I'm not comfortable with certain things there. But the beauty of democracy is that. Uh, you, if you're a minority, you have your same majority have his way. I am not confident. I feel that we're setting a dangerous precedent. Don't forget that when the PIB became uh, came to lie and became an issue of discussion, there was hyperdeck or hyperdeck, the hydro uh, something bill. Those who are the Niger state and other states where you have hydro power being generated call for such a bill for themselves. Does it mean that everywhere the national grid passed through, that's electricity pool and what have you, will become a part of the community that will be that will be benefit that will benefit from whatever is given to the host community on power generation? That's my reservation about it. I just feel that we should not do things that tomorrow will boom around and set us on a cycle that we will not be able to come out of. Wait, then on the uh, yeah, are you suggesting that? Um, if facilities or installations are, if they go through a location or domicile there, even though the crude resource is not in that particular location, they also have some sort of benefit because we just heard now that they don't qualify as host communities, that they are host communities, that they are impacted communities. Do they all have the same kind of benefit? Is uh, a matter of semantics. It was when, I mean, the process of lawmaking is a, is a long haul. So I know a lot of things we need to read. That's why I'm saying that, yes, we've time, we have able to get to this level, it's commendable. But I'm just saying that if you, if you, if this still has not, we are not at the end of this. Uh, maybe when we leave, years later, what have you, but that's the beauty of parliament too. But as we come to reject the law, I'm just expressing my own reservation that that should not have been an issue. And the frontier exploration, actually, in this it, I am aware by history, and everybody can go and search. There has never been a time that government put money for exploration of oil in the Niger Delta. The first uh, commercial crude oil, oil we got in Nigeria. The company involved spend their money until they go to that level. And if we are, because the intention of PIB uh, is to take government reasonably off some of these things, but if we are creating an avenue for certain resources that, look, I'm sorry, but become slush, I feel it is better for companies or businesses to be allowed on their own to make investment in exploration as it's been practiced now. So I am of the opinion that it's good we've got to this level, let be passed. But these areas, I had areas I, TJ, you see, were not too comfortable with, but the majority has this way, and I believe that it should still be looking to. If you remember, before you saw stop me, I was drawing correlation between the PIB and 
hydroelectric power generation community bill that was proposed by South State. I'm asking a question. If we say every way the pipeline bypass pass through the combo, uh, in fact, the public that has some benefit, do we see every way that the national grid pass through to will benefit from such a thing? Okay. That's my All right, so Honorable Waoba, could, could you give us your perspective on this point that he just raised? Well, I, I completely agree with him. It's a, it's a very dynamic uh, piece of legislation, and we do expect that uh, in years to come, we're going to have to sit and review and look at what's been working for Nigeria and what has not been working for Nigeria. The only thing that uh, is driving the thought behind what has been crafted in the PIB is, one, the, the, the investment required in the oil industry is very huge. And the second thing, obviously, is that it's a long lead business. It's a long-term business. It's not a business that um, is, is not just like buying and selling. You have to have deep pockets, you have to have staying power, you have to have technical capacity and all of that. And of course, over the time that we have had oil in Nigeria, what we're considering is, uh, is there a way that we can make things easier? The PIB that you have today that has been passed by parliament, I see it as a win-win situation. Some may argue that it's perfect, others may argue that it's not perfect, but it takes us from a no-law situation to a situation where we have some kind of regulation around the oil and gas industry. After all, the oil industry is still the golden goose or the goose that lays the golden egg. And to leave that level of uncertainty, um, the host community is a critical piece of uh, the, the, the PIB. It was actually a subset, a whole section in the Eighth Assembly when we broke it down into four parts. It was one whole part itself. And even on this time around, after the public hearings, we actually took the PIB to the regions. We went extensively and toured the Niger Delta and we sought to have their opinions so that we can capture a middle ground because the provision that came with the executive proposal was at 2.5%. But when the technical committee, both in the House and the Senate, met, we found a middle ground, 5%. And of course, yesterday, we're, we're not, the two uh, chambers were not able to harmonize because, again, when you take a report of parliament to plenary, anything can happen in plenary, and that's exactly what played out. But there are other very... Uh, important pieces to the PIB that we must not lose sight of. We, we looked at the administration issues, the governance issues, the fiscal policies surrounding the oil and gas industry, and we tried to incentivize uh, investment and at the same time not shortchange Nigeria. If we need to come back to this piece of legislation uh, sometime in the future, Definitely, that's what Parliament is for. We make laws, we review laws, we amend laws. And I'm not going to be surprised if this will be subjected to further legislative uh, fireworks. But the most important thing is that we will, for the first time, join in the Committee of Nations that will say that we do have, or the Parliament has passed, a petroleum industry bill to regulate the sector. And it has been hailed globally since Parliament achieved this feat yesterday. We do hope that the president will sign this bill into law because the executive uh, proposal that came contains over 700 amendments in our bid to ensure that we capture every input to strengthen and bring out a, a watertight piece of legislation. That you said earlier, Honorable, and, and I think it is something very significant that should be given due attention. You drew a difference between host communities and impacted communities. It is not unlikely that host communities may not be as impacted uh, by the activities of the petroleum industry operators as the impacted communities. To be specific, how well does this law factor in the interests and concerns of impacted communities? Uh, like I said, we already have uh, protocols that govern, um, let's just take oil pollution for instance. If a pipeline is passing through your community and for some reason, let's even not say uh, it was uh, vandalized, but maybe due to the age of the asset or uh, corrosion, uh, it becomes degraded to the point where there's spillage in the community and impacts the, the environment. Nigeria already has a set of protocols that govern this. What we, we 
try to do is not to have uh, a PIB that will answer everything. If there are areas where we have arrangements between the National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency, the Department of Petroleum in, uh, Resources, and the Ministry of Environment, and we have already identified how to categorize and respond to uh, environmental impacts that are happening outside of the host communities, we'll deploy those sets of protocols. But for the host communities, there was a lot of agitation, and it was necessary to actually focus on that and make sure that we accommodated because we sought to produce a, a legislation that will be a win-win on all sides. And that's just what it is. We have looked at the host community issues from that perspective. If, uh, like I said, down the road, we, needed, we will need to uh, broaden or expand to cover other areas for, uh, to capture impacts and all of that, we will also, I mean, this parliament has the, the we have proven that we have the political will to commit ourselves to a piece of legislation that has eluded us for over 15 years, and this time around, this is a piece of legislation that is in the interest of our country. I am a member of the PDP, I am a member of opposition, but I'm here today saying that the PIB is one piece of legislation that is good for us as a country. And I urge Nigerians to take a look at it. This is the document that is being celebrated. I took the liberty to bring this document to, uh, to um, to channels today so Nigerians can see the volume of work that has been done by Parliament. This is the document that will be going off, hopefully, uh, if we can go into conference and agree on the gray areas that seem to uh, not be aligned between the House and Senate, that's the document that we'll be sending off to Mr. President to sign off on. Honorable, uh, clearly, just as you said, there have been for and against to uh, the passage of the bill since it came out. So the natural question that comes to mind is, how is uh, the... Uh, how are you taking on board this... The, 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 the various angles, especially the propositions as against the bill that has been passed, you know, be that, which is going to, to the National Assembly. Is there a timeline for dealing with these issues? Uh, are they so significant? I mean, you, you already made it clear that it's a middle ground. What if the opposition is so strong? Well, uh, the bill-making cycle has actually been completed, uh, save for the fact that the provisions that the House of Representatives adopted yesterday for the host com provided for 5%, um, and then in the Senate, uh, they voted for 3%. Save for that fact, I would have been actually uh, committing uh, and, saying, and telling us that it's good to go to Mr. President. Um, unfortunately, what will now happen is that um, the, there will be a conference committee that will be established in National Assembly, uh, five members from the Senate, five from the House of Representatives. These 10 wise men will go in and take a look at uh, what the gray areas are, harmonize it, bring the report back to par uh, Parliament, and it's just going to be mere procedural. We will adopt and send. The, uh, the bill in itself hopefully would be signed. I do have a lot of optimism with the, the sheer volume of work that has gone into the bill. Um, it was actually well researched, a very good technical team at the back, the technical committee in, the, in parliament, uh, good uh, back office, good teams, a uh, lot of work, uh, support from the executive side, particularly the NNPC, from the minister to the GMD to the executive secretary of the PTDF, all the consultants um, and all the stakeholders. It's actually been robustly debated, exposed, impute taking, and all of that. If at the end of all of this, uh, it is signed off and we come to discover areas that are not working, we will come back to this same piece of legislation with amendments that will seek to correct those anomalies. So I just want to urge Nigerians to keep the faith, believe that the parliament that set out to say, look, we will give you the PIB in the Ninth Assembly, has actually de delivered on one of its legislative agendas. And if there's any uh, very important piece of legislation, really, to us as a country, uh, I think the PIB is it. And this 
is something that we, we, we are celebrating very seriously. Um, if it's not perfect, we will look at it again. I can tell you, I commit myself from the 8th Assembly, I'm a ranking member of Parliament, and from the 8th Assembly when I came in, I have worked, I dedicated a lot of time and resources to open up myself to learn about the Petroleum Industry Bill to make sure that I'm part of uh, the history making and yesterday history was made. If it's not perfect, we will correct those areas. Uh, what happened during the 8th Assembly? I mean, you were part of the 8th Assembly. The current speaker was part of the 8th Assembly as well. And, you know, like you referenced, it was broken down into different parts, the PIGB and the rest. Of course, that uh, PIGB eventually hit a brick wall, wasn't assented to by the president. I mean, you've not passed it, as you said. It has not been harmonized just yet to be sent to the president. But to what extent uh, did this current PIB build on what happened or the process uh, at the 8th or during the 8th Assembly? What's the difference? Because, I mean, we're looking at it going to the president. What are the guarantees that this will not end the same way the PIGB ended during the 8th Assembly? So to what extent is this different or did you build on the previous PIGB? Let us, uh, let us remain optimistic. Uh, the main difference is obviously that in the 8th Assembly, uh, it was a private member bill, and this time around it's a executive bill. Uh, so all the reasons adduced by Mr. President for withholding his accent were already carried in the proposal that was sent to Parliament from the executive. So what we worked on was actually the executive proposal, and that's where we now started from, where the executive stopped is where we now started from. And all we did was essentially to balance it out to ensure that Parliament brings a piece of legislation that is in tandem with the time and is uh, got uh, all it takes to deliver the dividends that we have promised in the PIB. Recall that I said that the extractives, particularly oil, uh, is, 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 is got an expiry date. If we do not put the necessary investments that will bring about the turnaround um, in the next two to three decades will be, will be carrying all that oil and be like Venezuela. To, uh, Venezuela has about 306 billion proven barrels reserve in the ground, second largest reserve, second to uh, Saudi Arabia. But because of strict uh, fiscal policies, no investment is going into Venezuela. And the truth about the oil industry is about investment. You, we, 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 use, we, we came down as a country from 36 rigs to about six rigs operating in Nigeria today. Since I've been in parliament, we have always predicated our budget from the MTEF on 2 million barrels or 2.2 million barrels production and of course the benchmark price. If we get it right, investment will come in. In the last 10 years, Nigeria has lost an opportunity for over $50 billion worth of investment, which means we're not really mining our assets. We're not drilling new acreages. No expansion is happening. Everybody is going to the same assets and just happy with what it is. If this PIB comes to, to play, I, I see a situation where we, Nigeria will be pushing OPEC to go beyond 2 million barrels uh, and, and perhaps uh, go for 4 or 5 uh, million barrels per day production. And I can tell you that will lead to double-digit growth in terms of our budget and the economy. So this is something that um, we believe in. We have worked on it. The difference this time obviously being that it came from the executive and we worked on it. We took what they, have, they had provided to us, worked on it, and turned it into the document it is today. We believe what we have uh, done is, a lot of exhaust, uh, is an exhaustive job, but it remains to see if Mr. President will sign it this time or not. But also remember that President withholding his accent is not the end of the, the, the cycle for the bill. Parliament does indeed reserve the right to veto Mr. President if we do believe that this piece of legislation is so critical to our national well-being, we can as well veto Mr. President and sign this bill into law. Oh, well, uh, Honorable, we've, we've hardly seen that happen. So I'm sure a lot of Nigerians would ask, is that really an option I, you are considering? I, re I, re I refer you to the NDDC Act. <laughs>
Okay, I mean, we, we saw the electoral bill during the 8th Assembly also, and people thought, will the National Assembly veto the president? But uh, let, let's still talk about that process. So you said the one we had during the 8th Assembly was a private bill. This one is an executive bill. How remarkable is the difference? And some might wonder, was this a plan all along to have the executive actually champion this process and ensure that at least they set the tone for what they want to happen in that industry? No, not at all. I wouldn't say that. Um, I was a part of the technical committee in the House of Reps that worked on the bill in the 8th Assembly, and I think what happened there was an issue of time. Uh, we concluded it towards the tail, uh, uh, the, the, the ending of the Parliament, and of course by the time Mr. President uh, gave his reasons, he wrote back to Parliament and stated out his reasons. We actually tried to rally ourselves to see if we can address those reasons, but we just simply ran out of time. Let's talk about the practicalities. I, I know this industry means different things to different people. The government, in terms of revenue, government agencies, in terms of regulation, the host communities which you have referenced. I mean, I could talk about the IOCs, OPEC, which you also referenced. I mean, the countries that we do business with as well, and the everyday Nigerian. So uh, let's begin with the government agencies, uh, NMPC, DPR, PPPRA, Petroleum Equalization Fund. Clearly, this bill, if it is passed into law, will change their faces. How? And that's a, a very uh, critical piece of information, uh, uh, advance or pro um, progress made. So we have governance issues, we have administration issues, and we think if we get those two right, we would have laid a solid foundation to build on the rest. In terms of the administration of oil and gas, the NMPC corporation as it is today, so the PIB is providing a two-tier uh, a framework to adopt a two-tier regulatory framework. If you, uh, the, the, the NMPC corporation today will become, uh, we, we have the commission and the authority. So you have some of the other government agencies that are going to be in the commission and doing all the regulatory works that you have, which is uh, you, you, you have the DPR and all of that. And in the authority, you will have NMPC PLC, which will become a private company that will be regulated by a board and hopefully between the two structures, we'll be able to prove, uh, provide effective regulation to ensure that investments are managed in the interest of the country in the first instance, and obviously to make sure that we deliver for the stakeholders that are coming in, in and in addition also the host communities. That is what the proposal of the PIB is. That is where we spent, uh, I, I believe, least amount of time because we had already done a lot of work in the 8th Assembly trying to look at the relationship between the Commission, the authority, and the NMPC structure as it is. The Petroleum Industry Bill does not provide for petroleum equalization because we're looking at a deregulated market. So eventually we will probably be seeing where market forces are playing out in determining the prices of petroleum products across Nigeria. It also does not recognize that we will continue with the sub current subsidy regime because again, it's going to be an industry that will be regulated by open market forces and what will happen is that economy and economics would drive what happens in the industry. Well, there's still a lot to say about that one. But let me, let me take it to Honorable Yusuf now. Um, I, I'm wondering, Honorable Yusuf, how you think this PIB significantly impacts the fate of host communities Specifically, I'm, I'm wondering how this new this law, this new law, will bring in a new regime of impact on host communities. Given that it would seem that the proposed bill uh, is taking into account the environmental impact of oil exploration, how does this law impact significantly differently from how the host communities and oil exploration uh, impact uh, has been? Previously, it's a very straightforward thing. Before now, the companies, the IOC, are approaching those communities, determine what they think those communities deserve. 
and you it are the rules and caprices of whoever is responsible for that. And it is seen as a favor. So now you have a law that mandates and gives responsibility to certain resources to be flow back into making sure that the environmental impact is minimized if not eradicated. So I think if we handle responsibly and we do not do this normal thing of looking the other way of the law and compromise our system, it will be possibly it will possibly impact the people. It will be far, 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 far reaching than what we need to have right now. So I am positive about that. In as much as I would I want it to be more than that. Uh, because the, because of years of neglect and indignation that happened in those areas. Like I was said, saying earlier, the Senate, uh, and even not just Senate, even House of them, members of the South South that wanted a 5%. Initially, it was a 10% concentration. So, but let's see how the 3% is being managed. That will justify an amendment and what have you. I, so, for now, sincerely, I can say, the law has this as positive proposal. Oh, you community. know, hitherto, I mean, just as you said, it would seem like maybe it was a favor, but at least it was something that the industry generally respected. But now the bill is making it clear that every licensee uh, must rehabilitate rehabilitate and manage the effects of petroleum operations on their environment. The question then is how do we ensure compliance with the law? A number of people would say there are several aspects of certain laws that are not given their due regard up until now. Uh, so what's the uh, assurance that people have, especially of the host and impacted communities, that this law will be followed to the T? First of all, what you are doing this morning, uh, I mean, bringing to the fore these issues for Nigerians to hear. So being educated by, helps in telling the whole world that this is the situation of law. Two, uh, the compliance or not compliance has to do with how committed those start with the responsibility of ensuring compliance to their job. We are not a lot of time, we are not in a lacking of good laws. Our challenges is the law of being implemented. Are they consequenced for flouting the law? And if Mr. A flouts the law, is it the full weight of the law does it come upon him so as to serve as deterrent to others? So I believe that. This time, there should be a conscious effort to make sure that nobody be under the table. Uh, the host communities, those who are privileged by God to have these resources, have gone through a lot. So if after many years of PIB, we have a PIB, what we can do to show good spirit is for us to make sure it is implemented to the latter. However, I'm not sure any way from the fact that people will attempt and people will even undermine the law. God, Honorable, what then do we do? Uh, we recognize that there are two commissions that have been set up um, to perform certain functions, the upstream uh, commission and the downstream and mid midstream commission, uh, regulatory commissions. Uh, but in the light or in the event that, that what you have said happens when some people try to undermine the law or some people try to circumvent uh, things, what do you propose? The law. Until the law becomes a leveler, that whoever you are, you plant the law and you go contrary to what the law says, let the full of the law come upon you. If we will not get out of this, so it's not about Nigeria. Human beings naturally tend to look for excessive liberty and abuse until it is known and, come, and it becomes clear that, that they are repercussions for such tendencies. Uh, when you allow or encourage wrongdoing, you are giving impetus to others to join. So, yes, 
the regulatory agencies that we set up, I mean, empowered by a law, by the law, if it is signed, <coughs> is there, it's, it's now for you, media, Nigerian people, we, we, I mean, with the information at our disposal now, look at areas of compromise we have noticed and bring it to the fore. Then call the regular, I mean, the, the security agencies into doing their job. I, why I ended my earlier comment with the fact that people will attend, people will do. I don't want to pretend that because PIA, that PIB now is a piece of legislation that has come from heaven, that Nigerians will not flout. Even the law of God, the human being flouted. So it is now the instrumentality of government to make sure that whoever goes contrary to this will face the wrath of the law. And, and unfortunately for us as a Nigerian, as Nigerians, this, unfortunately, is the only cow meat. This is the only farm. This is the only means that the government gets revenue. Which is what I mean, up to 60, 70% of our, our revenue comes from oil. So it is not a sector we should toy with. And that's why I, I believe that's one of the reasons the PIB took this long. A lot of compromise coming to this room. A lot of give and take. Like I express some reservation in some areas, but we have a law now. It's our responsibility to make sure that the law is respected. Areas who are not comfortable, we bring it back for amendment. That is done in the was done was in other clients. Honorable uh, Wabuba, talk to us about this other provision of um, the bill which is the commercialization of the NNPC. Is that privatization? So what that brings is, um, for the past 50 years, our oil industry has been running on a certain business model. And for we, we've always taken the oil, exported it, and brought it back as petroleum products. And so what we were looking at in terms of the commission, the authority, is to regulate and put a, a, a set of framework that would govern upstream operations and at the same time take a look at the midstream and the downstream sector and open it up. And I'll give you an example. Under the administration, the fiscal constraints for gas production uh, essentially is being removed. We want to incentivize, you remember that really what we are as a country is a gas country. Yes, we have gone in search of oil, but what everybody knows is that Nigeria, is, we have 200 and, I, be, I believe it's about 206 TCF of gas reserves. And for a midstream sector, that is a whole uh, industry that is available in terms of pipelines, fertilizers, petrochemicals, Everything you look around the room where you are, everything you, you see there from the furniture to the paint to the materials and all of that is a petrochemical industry that can expand and boom. So we have set this uh, two-tier regulatory framework that will open up this industry. We believe that Nigeria can actually use oil to get out of oil. You talk about diversification and all of that, build infrastructure. Where is the money going to come from? It's going to come from oil. And hey, this oil is going to last 30 years, three decades. Let's take it. So this is the time to put in the necessary framework in terms of regulation, the commission, the fiscals, the incentives. If I am if I'm now, uh, the hydrocarbon tax previously used to be about 85%. Uh, companies income tax, 30%. What is the middle ground? What can we say to an investor that can say, look, we can reduce your hydro, uh, hydrocarbon tax so that when you come into the oil industry in Nigeria, you are sure of what your liabilities would be. You are sure and there's certainty in the industry that, look, this is an industry that I want to play in or an industry that, uh, because capital looks for the most favorably, uh, favorable climb. Capital in the oil business is not good, just going to come to Nigeria because we have proven reserves. No, it's going to go into the countries that are putting in the right policies that will attract the investment, protect both the government revenues 
and assure them and also the, uh, what, what is in it for the investors. All right, Honorable Alba, I, I know that uh, there was that uh, back and forth about um, payments by host communities to, I mean, for damages to oil facilities during crisis. Uh, so what's the thinking of the House about that? The thinking of Parliament on that essentially is that um, we don't want to hand down uh, development to host communities. We want host communities to determine what they want and how they get it. We are making an extra effort to accommodate and make them comfortable. At the same time, we are asking for some responsibility because if you talk to the players in the industry, they will tell you that some of the, the mishaps that you see in the industry are actually acts of willful vandalization. Like I said, we are creating a bill that will cater to all scenarios and give Nigerians a win-win situation. The law will come down hard on criminality, but at the same time, the law will seek to protect the interests of the host communities. After all, it is said that what we have in the ground is actually not an inheritance from our children. It's something that we're keeping in trust for them. Okay. So we have but to act responsibly in terms of how we extract this oil, how we go back to remediate and put the environment back in a usable form that will benefit Nigeria and the so, generations that are But you know, th that comes across as though the, the drafters have at the back of their minds that it is the host communities that actually damage those facilities. Uh, so what happens, one, in the event that, uh, look, it's not damaged by host communities, and then if they are not able to pay, uh, what happens in that regard? Well, I mean, acts of criminality would always, uh, the, the long arm of the law would, would, would get to criminals, and I mean, um, the law would take its course. If uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know exactly what the provisions are in the uh, criminal code in terms of uh, damage to national infrastructure and uh, you're not able to uh, make amends what you have damaged. But I do believe that our laws are strong enough to uh, ensure that people who are caught in the act of vandalism, be it oil and gas infrastructure or other pieces of national uh, infrastructure, are held accountable and the, the law will take its course. So what would you say as we wind down to, to those who say that, uh, well, they're not exactly happy and not clear enough in terms of how the members of that uh, host community development trust fund will be appointed. How will members, you know, be drafted into the board, given precedence as to us not sticking to certain rules of appointing people into positions based on the law? You know, that's why it is important that parliament is seen as a friend to the people. When we call for memoranda and ask people to come be a part of a lawmaking process, we open it up to uh, a public uh, hearing. We, in this particular piece of uh, legislation, we did go around the, the region, uh, try to engage the host communities in representative capacities. We talked to the leaders of thought, youth groups, faith-based groups, the elders, the traditional institutions. Uh, we normally go into a state and pick a courtesy call to the governor, the governor would assemble a team, state a position that this is what they would like to see and all of that. And we okay, go through so all of that uh, bill making or law making cycle and at the end of the day, we still have, and I'm not surprised in any case, there's nothing you do that you will not have dissenting voices. But the thing is, what we need to know is that this is a very important piece of legislation that mm. Nigeria has been trying to put out for decades and finally, we have moved from a no law situation to a situation okay. where so, uh, the, this Ninth Assembly has given Nigerians a petroleum industry bill. Okay, um, ju just one more thing, and perfect, please, if you could respond uh, to this I quickly as well. And all to reach back to Parliament. So um, um, I'm available, I'm a member of Congress, and everybody is available. We will okay. look at it and hopefully we'll address those concerns. All right, just uh, as quickly as possible for this one, um, will a member of an impacted community 
or can a member of an impacted community be appointed into the host community development trust fund? I, I don't believe we provided for that. We believe we provided for members of the host communities. Um, impacted communities are things that we respond to and react to after an incident occurs. A host community is what we want to, to get as our benefit for hosting the oil or the natural resource in our community. There are two different clear distinctions. So what we have provided for are those members of the host communities to have a say on what they would like to see in terms of development of their communities. All right, then, Honorable Henry Mawaba, member of the PIB committee, thank you for your perspectives today. Thank you very much. Honorable Tajuddin Yusuf, thank you very much as well for your time. I would have loved to say something. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I would have loved to say something about the consequences okay. of the vandalization in the host community. Okay, just that briefly, as, as quick as you can, please. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, let me just say that. You won't need to have any fear of vandal coming to this community if the host community commission does what it needs to do. Naturally, vandalism, not, it does not exist, will, will be at very minimal. And the question you ask about if someone comes from outside of those communities to vandalize, we, we must define this in perspective. If it is a vandal outside the host community, how do we determine? So who do we hold responsible? Those are the areas that will require us to amend the law later. Those, those are the points we were trying to uh, get clarification on. Thank you very much as well.